us this morning, we're going to be interviewing Jared and Lauren, and they have, a, they have a story to tell us about victory in Christ. And our heart is to just explore a little bit of their journey, and uh, it is a redemption story. It's a story about coming to know Christ. It's about coming to victory in Christ. And uh, so we're going to throw around a few questions. Who's here to help me? Relax, guys. I'm more nervous than you. All right. So, yeah, like you said, it was a, it was a bit of a, us finding the truth and a bit of the truth finding us um, because it was, a, it was a, a path that not many take to get, to get there. A lot of people take a leap of faith, um, and I think that didn't happen with us. I think there was a... A big process of learning, a slow stepping process, um, and yeah, I mean, just to start at the beginning and how it got there. We don't uh, come from Christian families. Always had reports that were you can do better, and uh, I was always a bit rebellious at school, um, and I rebelled against um, authority in general. I think that went all the way up into into high school, and it also went against Christianity. I thought this was a system that was meant to enslave people. It was a book written by the Roman government um, to keep people in line and in check. And if you don't be good, you're going to go to hell. And um, that is what I thought. That is really how I looked at it. And I thought that people that were Christians were only Christians because their parents were Christians and they got brainwashed into it. My background is very similar to Jared's, same sort of um, family dynamics, a very secular home. We were pretty much brought up by the world and the beliefs that, you know, the world shared with us. Uh, you live for the weekends, you're entertained by television, um, you know, your school brings you up, so you learn a lot of your values from the, the system, essentially. Um, you know, and again, it doesn't mean that your parents don't love you or that they don't try and instill those good values, um, but there's no praying and it's a very spiritually dead foundation. But Jared, you know, the rebellious thing, uh, I think carried on a little bit more than high school, to be <laughs> honest. <laughs> but um, for me, it, was, it wasn't even really, uh, I wasn't even thinking on those terms as a child. I, I was more influenced by the new age. I had aunties who, um, and grandmothers that would howl at the moon when there was a death or, you know, tell ghost stories or believe in dream catchers or, you know, we were going to see a fortune teller. So, you know, that's kind of my upbringing was very um, based on spiritual things, but not Christian spiritual things. Um, we met when I was in grade 11, Jared was in matric, um, and yeah, it was all about drinking and partying and having a great time, and you know, the, the more raucous we could be, the better, and Jared and I really were that couple. We were always taking things too far, um, and this in, you know, included drugs, it included alcohol, um, tattoos, it was, you know, the, the more hardcore, the better, and we really had a, a reputation. We really did have quite a reputation, and um, we, we were together for two years. We broke up for two years, obviously, because the fruits of a relationship like that is just destruction. And so it didn't work, and we broke up. And in those two years that we weren't together, it, w it actually got worse for both of us. It didn't get better. Um, Self-destruction on both ends um, was just more and more prevalent. And um, in that time, I you know, took a a lot of acid and magic mushrooms, so a lot of psychedelics, and this is kind of where it gets a little bit more dangerous, if you could say, because when you experience those things and you use those substances, they do start to mimic spiritual experiences, and sometimes very real, in fact, exceptionally real, and so you're left with these experiences that you can't deny. And it seems like the light, you know? So when you take acid or you take shrooms and you start to communicate with a being from somewhere else, it can appear as an angel, but it's, it's not. Um, and it's difficult because it leaves you looped in a, in a state of mind where you come back to reality and you have these questions, especially com coming from a secular home. Um, it's hard to answer that because you don't know that that realm actually exists. Um, and for me particularly, you know, throughout this two years of not being with Jared, we often hooked up and met each other. We were very stubborn. Um, we knew we still loved each other, but uh, yeah, um, throughout that journey, there was always a search. If I wasn't making a concoction in my room with like a smudging stick 
because at one point I was doing Red Indian stuff, you know, I was praising the North and shamanism, then it was Buddhism, and then it was always trying to search for something, but never Christianity. Never. That's just, there was an absolute no-go. In fact, you know, in my drunken states every weekend, I would be the person prodding at Christians. I wanted to take them on. I wanted to aggressively destroy every belief that they had because I couldn't understand, couldn't understand it. And it was always strange if I look back now, why did Christianity aggravate me so much? You know, obviously there's a clue there. Um, but yeah, fast forwarding to when things really shifted for me, um, you know, throughout these weekends of self-destruction and taking drugs and, and alcohol and always being left more and more and more and more empty, I was really going down a bad, a bad road. Um, there was one particular evening, a friend of ours, we went to um, Newtown in Joburg um, and it was, we were like having this huge trance party in a di dilapidated building. Um, I think the toilets were even overflowing and we were all partying and chowing more shrooms and more. And, you know, all of a sudden it's like a veil lifted in the state and I was in hell. I was actually in hell. I could see demons in people. I could feel it. I, I, and I knew that this is not me. Um, this is not me. Um, and I said to my friend, we need to leave. You know, I almost... If we didn't leave where we were, I, I, I was ready to commit suicide almost, like run in front of a car or it was absolute hell. And I woke up the next day, although I probably didn't sleep, but I woke up from wherever I was. Uh, I didn't touch alcohol again. I stopped drinking. I stopped smoking. Um, my value shifted. Everything about who I was shifted. And if I could understand what it means to be born again, I believe that was an element of being born again. The only difference is I had no one there to share in my life that that was Christ. No one was there to say, hey, that's Jesus. And so because of that, I had to walk another five years without him, but he was always there, but not to my knowledge. Um, and so my process of sanctification actually came from, from that specific day. Um, and it was shortly after that experience that Jared and I then got back together. So I just, um, we've got a page here with a few things that we wanted to share and, and I, one of the things just jumped out on me here on the floor. It says, wake up sleeper, rise from the dead and Christ will shine on you. So I believe that was a waking up process and from, from that moment, bit by bit, Christ started to, to seep into our lives in, um, in everything we did. Um, I think at that exact time, like Lauren says, we were apart and those two years that we were apart was quite a lot of destruction. I got arrested for possession of narcotics and I spent four days in jail and then uh, I got out and decided to go drilling again and I rolled my mom's car. Sorry mom. <laughs> I thought I had your car. <laughs> it's a redemption story. <laughs> <laughs> yeah so I mean things just happened again and again but um, now I look back on it and I realize that God really had grace um, and a lot of it, up until a point where it was like, I knew, uh, like, like Lauren says, we knew about the spiritual realm, we knew that it existed, we didn't know exactly how it was and what was the truth, but we knew that it was there, and I knew that I was getting knocks from what I called at the time the universe, saying, listen, you need to change your path. That when you were in that really bad state, you knew from that that evil existed. It was a key thing. Okay, I now believe that evil exists. And then it took you on a journey, both of you. You acknowledged evil exists. And then you were on this journey of, okay, so if evil exists, what is evil opposed to? Through, through all our research, I mean, we knew something was wrong with the world. Uh, there's something wrong, guys. <laughs> The system, the rat race, the, the debt, the entrapment, the, 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 the way that the world works, there's something wrong, and we knew that. Um, and it was about figuring out why, is it, why does it work like this? Why, um, yeah. And, and to get, to get uh, from Christians, when, when they tried to provide an answer, it was almost like, oh, just believe in Jesus and he'll save your life. It wasn't enough. I needed to understand. I needed to know. I needed to make sense of it and experience it. So constant research, constant research, finding out, okay, there is evil in the world. There is a system at play and there is actually forces 
Um, Ephesians 12, no, 6, 12. We've got, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, and against powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in heavenly realms. Um, from our research, we knew that that was, that was real. I didn't know that that's what Jesus was fighting against, and that's what God's role in all of this was, was to set us free from the system, to set, us, set free the captors. Um, I knew that we were in a system that we were, we were slaves, and um, I didn't know how to escape. And little by little through research, um, one of the guys, Lee Strobel, um, was, was fascinating for me. Testimonies really changed everything. Before I started reading the Word, I, I watched testimonies to try and start understanding why, why are people um, going towards this, and why, why do the evils of the world hate him so much? Because they must hate him for, for, for some reason. I mean, why is the system all set up against him? Um, and yeah, Lee Strobel went on this, on this journey of trying to prove his wife wrong, who became a believer. And he was an academic, he was a journalist. And he went and did so much research to try and disprove all, all of it and ended up finding out that the historical artifacts, the, the, that the eyewitnesses, that the, the credibility was astounding. And he ended up becoming a believer and becoming a pastor. And there were stories like that that, that changed me. It wasn't just from a Christian to say you have to believe in Jesus or you're going to go to hell. It was more of a, a clear understanding that this was the truth because it was the truth. Not because I had to take a leap of faith, although I did take a leap of faith later. Yeah. Um, it didn't start like that. It started with the actual knowledge. You spoke about the fact that you did meddle a lot in the New Age. And so t tell us something about the New Age and how you are perceiving it. You know, when we spoke earlier about these powers and principalities that we came to know about, when you understand what their agenda is, you start to see very clearly what the purpose of the New Age is. And ultimately, that is to get everybody under one religion and believing in one God. And what better way to do that in something like the New Age that allows you to be God? And so when you become a Christian, you learn things like the devil comes and deceives. He will come as the angel of light. He cannot make anything of his own, so he will steal and twist it and make it, you know, counterfeit. And that exa that's exactly what the New Age is. And what's so dangerous about the New Age is that there are real, tangible experiences there. They exist. And um, so I think that's really the purpose of the New Age is it's... Satan has his ways of really climbing in, even into Christians' lives, and I think that's what's more scary now coming from that coin, is just seeing how um, compl complacent Christians have become with things like yoga. You see it being allowed into churches now, and, um, you know, oh, it's just yoga, it's just movements, but it's really not. It's really not just that on a spiritual level. It's so, so much more. Coming from the New Age and, and being in Christianity now, I can tell you that there's actually so much reading the Bible, speaking in tongues, healing. And I'm like, hold on a minute, but then this is actually rightfully ours. They've stolen it from Christians, but what they've done now is they've demonized it. And so Christians themselves don't even want to do the very things that we're called to do because we've made it seem like it's taboo and it's wrong. But actually, like God said, he, there's nothing new under the sun. They make those things new, right? You're always buying a book that's hidden knowledge. That's what they, you're just paying these gurus because they've got some knowledge that you don't have, but it's not. It's counterfeit and it's been stolen. And I think if there's a message from us coming from the other side to people that have perhaps always been Christians who are weary, of course we have to be careful. But um, just to be more yeah, open to the things of like the gifts of the Spirit and things that we've sort of been going on lately, um, we have to claim back what is actually rightfully ours and make it, in, you know, it's like a gun. It's like, is the gun bad or is it the person handling the gun? And it's the same concept behind a lot of what we have. Um, and, and we need to, you know, dominion. Take, take our dominion back. It's, it's, it's ours. <laughs> Yesterday we had a ladies' meeting and we really s spoke into this thing of that we as women are queens and we have a dominion. We have an area of influence and authority, and we have a choice. Are you going to take that up, or are you just going to remain in your apathy? And I think that is just something that the enemy wants you to do, is stay in your place of mediocrity, apathy, because then 
you are not a warrior, you are not a soldier, you are doing nothing, and that's where the enemy wants you. And, and that, is a, that is a massive indictment on us as believers. If we do not take hold of that power and that authority that God has given us. And so I'm so grateful. Um, and I believe that with that comes a responsibility. And, and that's where it also becomes hard to be a Christian because you are left with a responsibility now. He didn't just do this for nothing. He didn't call us for nothing. Um, and so there's a, a heavy responsibility to to make sure that we, we do right by him. I remember last year when, when you two were, there was just, there was a lot that you were dealing with and, and going through. And um, I, I didn't necessarily know because it was in the lockdown. But I remember God giving me two words. And I shared them with Lauren. And I said, Lauren, I see two words that are key for your lives. And the one is consistency and the other is perseverance. And I, I know that that for every single one of us, our greatest testimony is when we are consistent and when we persevere. That we, we take a stand and we say, okay, so I've taken this stand with this addiction or with this situation. And now I'm going to remain consistent in this decision and I'm going to persevere. I'm not going to give up. And I know for you guys, that's been like, a, like just a part of this journey, this thing of consistently leading your children well, consistently working on your marriage and how the two of you speak to each other and interact. And that is the same for all of us. I know for Millen and myself, it's this thing of, okay, we stand on this thing and we will persevere in our love and our commitment to each other in our love and our commitment to our Father. And I think that that is just a key thing to know, that we cannot wave a magic wand and go, boom, you are now saved and you are now perfect because there is a process of sanctification. You are justified once off. You are saved. You now know Him. Yes, justified. But the process of sanctification is long and hard, and it's all about perseverance and consistency. And I think that's a key thing for us to go away with from today. Yeah, that's very good. I shared the other week um, just a lecture I was listening to, and the guy said he got saved from drug addiction, but he didn't forget how to roll a blunt. It didn't fall off at the cross. There was a process of working stuff out. And uh, I, I love what he says because... Consistency is, is really a, a powerful testimony. It's keeping the, keeping not the up and down, up, constantly, there's a, there's a progression. The, the, the Christian walk is a progression. I'd just like to say thank you. Like you said now, I mean, I dipped my toe for a very long time. I dipped and then pulled out and dipped and pulled out. And no one ever made me feel like if I don't jump in now, uh, I'm going to have to go. So, yeah, that was important for me, and thank you to, to all of you that made it a, a, a comfortable transition wow. yeah. to the kingdom, yeah. Mm -hmm.